Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the next Whale Sanctuary Project webinar. And this one is going to be really interesting one. It's going to be all about poop, snot, and blow. So bring the kids. I'm Lori Marino, president of the Whale Sanctuary Project. And I just want to say a little bit about what we're going to do today. Authentic cetacean sanctuaries are places where the autonomy of the whales is a priority. Therefore, studies of their psychology and their physiology and their biology and behavior, uh, while necessary for caregiving, should really be as non-invasive and non-intrusive as possible. The challenge becomes actually the main strength of the, of the cetacean sanctuary work as it can drive innovation in cetacean research and healthcare applicable to both free ranging whales and whales in captivity. So there is a real synergy here between cetacean uh, health assessments in the wild and those that will take place in the sanctuary. In this webinar, we're gonna be exploring three cutting edge health assessment techniques employed in the wild that really have the potential to elevate healthcare in sanctuary whales and how sanctuary-based procedures can also be used to improve methods used now helping animals in the wild. Um, a, a few housekeeping things, please post your questions in the Q&A and uh, right after our presentations, we will get to as many as possible. So today I'm joined by uh, three experts in this area, uh, Dr. Deborah Giles, Jeff Foster and Dr. Ian Kerr. And I will say a little bit more about my guests uh, right before they give their presentations. Uh, for now, I'd like to start out uh, with a review of the Whale Sanctuary Project to set the stage. So I just want to start out talking a little bit about why we are even doing this. Why is this important? Why are we spending so much time creating sanctuaries in the sea for individual whales who are currently living in concrete tanks? Well, the reason is, is because we know from all of the growing scientific evidence that these individuals do very poorly in the tanks. Their, their health and their well being, their quality of life, and their, their just lifespan are all compromised. We see this in the form of systemic and opportunistic infections. Um, in, form of pneumonia and other lung diseases, yeast infections, candidiasis, gastric ulcers, and other stomach diseases, and cephalitis. All of these are common in captive dolphins and whales. And the question becomes, well, why if they are living in a closed environment? The, we also see many common signs of mental illness. Uh, behavioral stereotypes are quite common. These are behaviors that are like circling uh, incessantly, banging their body against the sides of the tank, damaging their teeth by scraping their teeth on the sides of the tank. These are all kinds of behaviors that are due to chronic stress and attempts to cope with a very unnatural environment. Um, and we don't see these kinds of things in the wild because in the wild, they're in the environment they evolved in. We also see a lot of depressive behaviors like anorexia, logging, and also disturbed social interactions like hyperaggression towards other whales, including humans, and patterns of poor parenting, failure to attach and thrive. So these animals don't thrive in concrete tanks. And our aim through the Whale Sanctuary Project is to provide a model that allows people to see that we can go from all of this to this. 
this is our sanctuary site in Port Hilford, Nova Scotia. Now, this is another photo from a different angle of our sanctuary. And I would just like to explore some of the principles of an authentic cetacean sanctuary. They represent a new relationship with cetaceans. It's a place where individual dolphins and whales can thrive, not just live, not just try to eke out an existence, but to actually thrive. It's not the same as being in the wild. It never will be. It's still captivity, but it is so much closer to what these animals need to thrive than a concrete tank. Resident well being and individualized lifetime care are the priorities. And we're going to be talking about some of the ways that we can move back and forth between lifetime care and cetacean sanctuaries and the wild. No performances, no breeding, no unnecessary invasive procedures. Promotion of autonomy and a natural life as much as possible. It's a place where we can finally do authentic education, authentic conservation, and be fully transparent about what's going on. So we can tell the public why these animals need to be in the ocean. And in doing so, we support and promote the work of conservationists, kinds of people that I have as my esteemed guests and others who are working with whales in the wild. It's important that whales and dolphins be in the environment that they evolved in. So it's important to get those who are not there closer to it and to also use that to teach people that we should be experiencing them, relating to them in their natural environment, not in concrete tank performing tricks. Of course, any authentic sanctuary is going to be sustainable with the environment and is going to be located in a community that embraces the sanctuary mission. And here's where our sanctuary is. Here's Sherbrooke, Port Hilford. It's about two hours or so east of the, the city of Halifax. This is the bay. Port Hilford Bay, and you can see where I've indicated where the sanctuary will be. And this is an artist rendition taken from the topography of the area, what a sanctuary will look like. It will be over 100 acres, which is 150 times larger than the largest tank. It will be netted off and uh, for six to eight, beluga whales, two to three orchids in a separate area. We will have a full veterinary service. Um, we will feed them, uh, we will care for them, and we will help them move on a path towards autonomy to give them back the life of a whale as much as possible. So helping them to be whales again for the first time in their lives we are really interested in finding ways to stay on top of their health without disturbing them. And of course, that's the priority for wild cetaceans as well. So there's a perfect synergy there. So let's get into our, our webinar where we're gonna hear about some really interesting methods to do that. We're gonna start with Dr. Deborah Giles, who is Science and Research Director of Wild Orca and has been a friend for many years. Uh, she's one of the world's leading experts on the Southern resident killer whales in the Washington State area. She collaborates with the University of Washington Center for Conservation Biology. She collects and analyzes uh, feces of the free ranging Southern resident orcas. We're going to be hearing more about that. And these samples are, are really fascinating because they reveal all kinds of things like stress hormones, DNA, reproductive hormones, as well as whether there are any toxicants in, in that the animals are uh, taking in. She does this with the help of her 
very famous poop sniffing dog, Eba, who I've had the good fortune of having lunch with and meeting on uh, San Juan Island. So Giles, please take it away. Thank you so much for uh, having me here uh, today, Lori, and uh, with these two amazing gentlemen too, to get to um, co-present with. Um, Lori, and thank you uh, publicly so much for your contributions to my classes. Every year, uh, Lori comes and does a fabulous talk on uh, the brains of cetaceans, and uh, my students are always so thrilled and, and write back uh, amazing things. And also, Jeff and Katie, thank you for your contributions to my class and the students um, at Friday Harbor Labs as well. So um, I have a very quick PowerPoint. And um, if anybody uh, has seen my PowerPoints in the past, you'll be shocked at how I uh, and then a very quick video, which I'm very excited about. And this will actually be our first my first time showing this to anybody. It is it is available online. It just came out last week. But um, Okay, so just a very, very quick primer on uh, the Southern residents. This is Eva. Um, I'm currently working for the Center for Conservation Biology, a program at the University of Washington. Um, and I'm thrilled to say that uh, Sam Wasser is going to be tr uh, <clears throat> transferring the program to, to me and my nonprofit at the end of this year. Uh, we're very excited yep. about that. And we'll have a joint announcement very soon about um, the details about that. Has been going on under Sam, Dr. Sam's lead at Sam Wasser's lead since 2007. Uh, the southern residents are the only population of killer whales on the endangered species list in this country, and so are a vast majority of the prey runs that they are uh, that they co-evolved with. So many of the different runs of salmon that these whales target and again co-evolved with from Monterey, California up to Southeast Alaska are also on the endangered species list. The whales were listed in this country in 2005 because of lack of quality and quantity prey, again, specifically Chinook salmon, vessel presence and associated noise of all types of vessels from this large deep sea container ship uh, with J27 in front there. This is in Haro Strait. Um, and also, um, lastly, uh, although there are many, many different uh, threats that these three main identified ones, the last one being exposure to toxicants, specifically toxicants, meaning human-made um, uh, chemicals uh, compared to toxins, which are created by plants and animals. Um, our study area, we've been, again, studying since 2007. I've been on this project since 2009. Current study area is the larger circle here on the, on the right, and then uh, the expanded area, which will start in the spring, uh, this coming spring of 2020, to expand out to the area where the whales are spending a, a tremendous amount of time. In fact, uh, uh, colleagues, uh, colleagues from uh, Jeff and Mike uh, from NOAA are out there right now um, collecting information on those animals. So our whale scat team uh, was very much truncated in 2020. Here's a quick picture of what we looked like uh, then. That's my husband driving the boat and our dog, uh, Eba. Thankfully, 2021, we were able to have some of our volunteers come back on board uh, which is tremendously helpful to take the massive amount of health uh, monitoring data that we take. Um, and then just a very quick uh, stylized view of what, uh, what we're doing when we're out there. And the video that I have to show you in a minute will uh, show this in action. Um, and then the video doesn't do um, a great job of uh, showing Eba after she gets her reward. So this is what Eba does her job for. <laughs> Eva, get it. Good job. Good girl. So I could pretty much watch that all day, but I'll, I'll end it a little early. So as Lori hinted, uh, one scout sample can tell us a tremendous amount of information about these animals. Uh, here on the left is a list of uh, the basic things that we are analyzing and looking at, at scat samples. And this picture at the top here, that's Dr. Wasser there and uh, a, a videographer actually from Netflix um, that, uh, that filmed us collecting our first ever humpback feces in 2019. That was pretty exciting. And down here are some pictures of different types of uh, di different uh, examples of killer whale scat. 
these are very healthy scat samples. Uh, these days we're seeing tiny, tiny little bits like that, which is not what we want to be seeing. So some of our findings, uh, the whales have um, a, a very, very high pregnancy failure rate up to 69%. Um, the toxicants are amplified in the system as the whales are not getting enough to eat, they metabolize their blubber, blubber which releases the toxicants into their system and creates a, a wide variety of different problems like immune compromised systems and um, lethargy and uh, a whole host of, of different problems and ultimately um, lending to or causing early disease or death. And I really love this picture and I, I've been including this in all of my presentations lately. And this top statement here was uh, something that uh, another researcher of, of killer whales, uh, Alexandra Morton, uh, she pointed out that if we lose this population of killer whales, it will be the first time in history in which we have uh, let an endangered species go extinct in which we knew every single individual of a population uh, that, that numbers more than one or two animals. And so uh, with the loss of every member, we lose uh, critical, uh, critical members of, of this uh, amazing population. A quick shout out to my volunteers, including my uh, husband, Jim, again, uh, for stepping up last year and really taking over the, the helm there to help keep this program going. And couldn't do this at all without our funders. The Rose Foundation and the Paul G. Allen Family Foundation are our funders uh, most recent uh, in the last four years. So hopefully I can quickly segue to a, um, a video that um, I'm just absolutely shocked and thrilled. Um, some of you will, will recognize the voice narrating this video. This just was released in the, in the UK last week. We have not gotten it yet to this country, but it should be here. Um, very soon. It will be on Discovery Plus when it's released. And this is, uh, we were, were very honored to be uh, um, asked to participate in uh, Prince William's new Earthshot Prize program called Repairing the Planet. And you can see it on BBC. Thank you, Giles. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And, and uh, we're honored that we were able to show this for the first time in this country and really look forward to letting people know where they can get it and see it when it, when it becomes available. So thank you so much. Um, next, I want to go to our own Whale Sanctuary Project's Jeff Foster, who has worked with marine mammals for 45 years at least, and is currently our animal trainer and rehab coordinator uh, for the project. He has developed several techniques used to successfully rehabilitate and conserve cetaceans in the wild. And Jeff is going to be discussing the work he's doing in collaboration with uh, several other folks in the Salish Sea, uh, refining ways to take respiratory samples of uh, blow <laughs> from free ranging orcas in the Salish Sea. So Jeff, please take it away. Thank you, Lori, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, and again, this is uh, it's it's great to be here with everybody, and and hopefully we can enlighten you a little bit with some of uh, the challenges that we face with these animals out in the wild, and 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 what we can do with uh, with the sanctuary and the and the excitement about having something that is that is not uh, it's not a concrete pool. It's something that is more natural, and and it gives us the ability to be able to study these animals in a way that. We really haven't studied before, so uh, it's a tough act to follow the Attenborough and poop, but you know, I'll give it a try. <laughs> so let me start screen sharing here. So as I say, the challenges of studying these guys in the wild is really difficult, and and not only do you have the marine environment, which is is dynamic as it is, because you never know what the weather's going to be like, and and uh, but you also deal with animals that are are different than terrestrial animals, and, and much harder to study. And because we're in a marine environment, you have water hydraulics, you know, pressure changes, temperature changes, all these kind of things. So it's been difficult to study these guys, and and so we've lagged behind the the study of these animals compared to our, our terrestrial counterparts. But 
we this kind of how I kind of got involved in this. And going back, I've never really developed any of these uh, tools to be able to study. It's always been a team of people. It's it's a team of people that are that are dedicated to the study of these animals and trying to understand them a little bit better. And so it's a it's a team, and this team gets bigger every year with with uh, citizen scientists and people helping out to try to understand these animals a little bit better. But it started about 15 years ago with Springer, uh, with the respiratory samples for us. And we had an animal, uh, for those of you who don't know, it was a little animal, uh, Northern resident who was out of habitat and uh, was found in the lower Puget Sound off Bashan Island. And we watched her for about six months and watched her help deteriorate. And we had this, this, this animal that we were watching her slowly die. And, but we, we, didn't, we didn't know what she was dying from. We didn't know what the, the problem she had what she was carrying so we wanted to try to get out there and try to get as much information of her from her as we could so we uh uh but there's only so much you can do especially if you want to try to manage the animal in the future if you if you go up and you try to catch the animal and get the blood samples and those kind of, kind of things from her she's likely never to, to approach a boat again so so finding a way to be able to to sample her and try to determine her health uh, was challenging. So we reached out to a gal named Betts Robinson and who was do, studying, uh, she was studying chemo communications in elephants. And she was just kind of starting off her, her groundbreaking work with, with cetaceans. And what she was doing uh, was she was taking respiratory samples with a, uh, with a canister under reverse pressure. So it would suck these respirations in. So that was a tool that we hadn't seen before. And we used it on Springer and we were able to determine that she had some uh, severe health issues. She was basically starving to death. So that was kind of the start of this whole thing. And, and from there, we, we, we saw, knew that this was an incredible tool that, 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 that these, these respirations can tell us a tremendous amount of, of, of information. And, but we were, at the, again, at the infancy of this. And this, with science, sometimes it takes time. And in, and in the field, and especially working with marine mammals, things move slower than you ever think they, they possibly could. But, it's, but we are at a point now where that technology is catching up to us, you know, to, to catching up to the point where we can get out there and do, do this stuff with uh, cetaceans for, that we've been doing with terrestrial animals for years. And that's just trying to find out baseline information. But so, so we took that, it was uh, Dr. P Peter Schrader and uh, Linda Rhodes, Dr. Linda Rhodes, and they took it one step further. We, we said, okay, now if we can take auger plates, put them on a pole and try to, try to get respiratory samples, then we can, we can see what, you know, what these animals are dealing with. So we started with that. And, and to do that, we have to also have the, check the micro layer of the, of the habitat these animals are in. And what we found with the micro layer, layer was that these animals are swimming in this toxic soup. This, it sits on the surface. And we thought, well, in lower Puget Sound, we can understand that. But as we did the sampling, we went all the way up in Northern Canada, and it was pretty much the same in all the inland waters, that we have this layer of, of nasty stuff sitting in the water. It's mm -hmm. everything that's been pumped into the sewers and floating on the surface for years. And, and like, uh, like Joss says, likely a lot of toxins in that, that micro layer. So we, from there, I said, okay, we need to be able to kind of basically separate the wheat from the chaff. And, and how do we sample these guys and, and, and without getting that micro layer in there? And, and that, that was challenging. We always thought before that, that if we could uh, sample close to the bullet hole, as close as we could, we'd get the most of the exhalation and, and then we'd get those samples. But, but the, those, the water particulates in the and the samples can taint those, those samples. So trying to work around that has been challenging, but we, we get a tremendous amount of information as we do that. Um, oops. And this is some of the stuff that we can, that we can, uh, we can determine from these animals. And again, it's, it's, there's, we need to be able to, you see on the, the left-hand side there, the pink dots uh, indicate that XLs of the breath, and then you got the micro layer, and then the control of the rain, human uh, uh, impacts on the, the sample, and that kind of thing. So to be able to figure out all this, it's it's a it's a it's a long, challenging process, and it's again studying it in the field is very difficult. And again, this is one of the reasons why a sanctuary is is a is really an ideal place to study these 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 kind of things or, or test these kind of techniques and tools that we use to study these guys. They we have 
you know, limited uh, amount of time and money to be able to study these guys in the, in the wild. They are expensive to study in the wild. They're, they're challenging because you, know, you never know where they're going to be. They're not like, again, like a terrestrial animal. But if we have a, a, a you know, a, a, a sanctuary, uh, we have something where it's, all, it's close to their, to their natural environment. It's a lot different than a concrete pool where the animal isn't uh, swimming in natural patterns and, and diving to depths that they would normally be diving to. So okay, this this opportunity to work with the sanctuary and develop these kind of things has been really exciting. And we've been, we've been pushing it a lot and, and hopefully in the future, we'll be able to continue with more of it. But for these samples, we can, we can get respiratory microbiomes. We can get uh, pathology that, that uh, to track respiratory assessment and, and uh, you know, and possible, uh, uh, resistance to antibiotics. We can do uh, uh, metabolics. We can do hormone analysis. We can do genetics and DNA. There's a tremendous amount of information just from a blow, and we never would have thought that before. We would have, we you know we think oftentimes about our 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 gut biomes and 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 how important those are. But it turns out that we have them in in a lot of our organs in our bodies and and rest, and through the lungs we can get a lot of this information. Um, so the sampling has gone from, from using the poles and things like, uh, you know, to get as close as we can to the animals, but, but that is, is also pushing these animals a little bit. It, it, we're also approaching, approaching these animals in a way that sometimes uh, they, you know, don't like, or they want to avoid. And, and that's the last thing we want to do when we're studying these animals, especially in highly endangered animals like the, the Southern residents. We want, to, we want to stay at a distance. And that's why Giles's work is, is so important because it's non-invasive. It's, it's tracking the animals at a distance and uh, letting them go through their natural behaviors. And then, um, and then you know, trying to collect the samples and, and determine their health. And we can use that in, in uh, it, for animals like this little J50. This is a little animal that uh, was, uh, was as a, a Southern resident that a few years ago, uh, she was, came into the area and, and we, about the same time that uh, Delikwa was here and, and we noticed that she was gradually starving to death. And so we use these, again, these sampling techniques to be able to, to try to determine her health and to try to treat her in the wild, which was kind of the, it was the very first time that it had ever been done with a killer whale. And the goal was to try to get, you know, to try to figure out what she was dealing with first. And we were able to, to get a few respiratory samples and we knew that she wasn't, she wasn't doing very well. And this, so the next step was to try to get some, some medication into her. So we worked with the, the Lummi tribe and, uh, with them to try to acquire some Chinook salmon. And we were, the, the, the idea was to put the medication into the live fish and release them in front of uh, J50. And hopefully that she would ingest the fish and, and the medication at the same time. And, and it would be a good thing. So again, this was, it was just kind of a start of a novel idea. And, and that's where all this starts from. But it, uh, but you just never know where it's gonna take you. And, and where it's taking the S next is very exciting. And this is where I'm going to hand it off to Ian because the kind of, so the, the new technology and some of the new tools out there that are just amazing. Ian, all you. Thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you. And last but not least, uh, let me introduce Dr. Ian Kerr, uh, who is CEO of Ocean Alliance. And this is a, an amazing organization that was founded by Dr. Roger Payne. Uh, back in 1971. Uh, Dr. Kerr is really an innovator of non-invasive uh, assessment techniques, and he's going to tell us about one that he calls the SNOTBOT. And uh, he's just an expert in drone-based uh, health assessments of free-ranging whales. He is also recognized as a visionary leader by the Annenberg Foundation and has run over 40 expeditions in 20 different countries. So it's really my honor uh, to have Dr. Ian Kerr here. Thank you. Well, thank you, Laurie. I have to say I'm now totally intimidated by, by Giles and Jeff, but uh, what do they say? <laughs> Building on the work of giants, presuming that uh, a giant is meant as a complimentary term, but wow. 
And, and I will say, actually, um, it's very interesting because actually a lot of the work I started doing was related to environmental sort of toxicology. And mm -hmm. um, it's interesting how that's sort of a, 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 a key issue of um, uh, both Jeff and Giles. I'm just trying to get my screen up to the front here. Well, um, you know, clearly uh, I'm, I'm lucky that Giles and Jeff left some air in the room, you know, so uh, I will bring that in as, as, as much as I can. Certainly, you know, when we look at the bigger picture, I also like people to sort of understand the idea that, you know, healthy whales, healthy oceans, healthy humans. And I think it's, it's in our own interest to have healthy whales and healthy oceans. And I don't think people real, realize that. It's not just some intangible thing. And I really like what Giles said, you know, about the emotional thing. I have to tell you, I think there may be two or three of us here that actually prefer whales to many humans that we know. But, but anyway, but there is just this reality, you know, the oceans are the largest mediating force on the planet. And the mammals that are the top of that ocean food chain are, are cetaceans and, and humans. And alas, um, ocean exploration really has been a bit of a prerogative of the privilege. You know, as Jeff said, it's just not cheap. You know, and what breaks my heart a little bit too is, is some of the most sort of diverse and productive areas of the world or off countries that don't have the budgets that maybe North America has. I mean, this is a fantastic boat to the left. I think it's the, the Atlantis, it's Woods Hole, and it's like $30,000 a day. And, you know, there are so many good people, good minds, good hearts that want to get involved in this work, but just don't have the capacity. And I run actually a very small nonprofit, as I think Deborah and, and Jeff do. And the reality is, you know, we have to innovate just to be able to compete. And I think it's great how, I'll be blunt, I didn't know Jeff and Deb and uh, Giles before today, and yet we, we've, we've done so much that is similar. And um, Jeff really spoke about this, but I, but I call it the endangered species catch-22. There, there tends to be two camps out there. And camp number one says, interfere, study, get the data, do whatever you can, you know, to sort of save this species. We have to get involved and, you know, sort of work with them, you know, before they, before they become extinct. Mm. And then there's the other group who are basically saying, don't do anything that might sort of push this animal over the edge of, of you know, extinction. You know what I mean? So it's a challenge. And I like to think with the work that Giles is doing, the work that Jeff is doing, the work that we're doing, is we're coming up with an alternative, you know, a way to collect biological health data on whales in a non-invasive manner. Now, actually, I spent a lot of my life doing um, um, toxicology with sperm whales, and basically we have this crossbow. And um, as Jeff would say, we would chase these animals down and shoot a dart into them. Now, this dart was small, about the size of a pencil or razor, but the reality is, chasing the animal down to collect the data. Uh, you, you know, I mean, I, I don't even like going to the doctor myself sometimes, and I know what's going on. These animals have no idea what's going on. And I was working um, in the Gulf of Mexico after the Deepwater Horizon disaster, um, working with sperm whales there. And I'm not trying to diminish the work, but I felt like I was playing the world's most expensive version of whack-a-mole. Or in this case, it would be whack-a-whale because a whale would come up over here and we'd race over there. And just before we got there, it would dive. And then I would race over there and it would dive. And of course, I'm literally ripping up $100 of bills as we're doing this. And um, in part from desperation, you know, I was sitting on the bow of the boat uh, one night, the, the whale had dove. And, you know, I have to say to my donors, there's so many good projects out there, you know, what, what sort of the cost benefit ratio of the work I'm doing. And not getting the samples was not good. And at that time, I then got covered, covered in this cloud of icky, sticky, smelly whale smot, snot or whale exhaled breath condensate. And, um, you know, I realized, wait a minute, you know, as a biologist, sticky and smelly means productive. So I'm like, wait a minute. Um, and if you'll forgive me, it's like, I think I smell a solution here. <laughs> and um, I did a little bit of research and, um, 
I heard it was probably about uh, Jeff, the lady you're wo working with. I heard that people had had animals in captivity and they'd successfully got some biological products from um, whale snot. And I heard that Carina Whitehouse had tried with a gasoline powered um, sort of helicopter down in the Gulf of Mexico. So guess what? My hobby, I think it's always good to have a hobby that is as far away from your work as possible. My hobby was building, flying, crashing, braking, you know, a variety of flying vehicles. And I thought, can I fly something into the exhalation of a, of a drone? And I have to tell you something, which is, which is fair enough, but, um, you know, I spent a year and a half trying to raise the money, trying to get people to believe it. And people didn't believe the idea. They didn't like the idea. And um, it was pretty scary that first time I was down with the right whale and, and you know, can we sort of collect the snot. And of course, as Jeff has said, it turns out this whale's exhalation is just throwing up into the air this priceless biological data sets. And I think in many ways, as we're getting better sensors, better tools, better detectors, better capacity, you know, exhalation of whales and maybe even other animals is be gonna become a more and more valuable um, sort of data set. Now, our goal was not to make a product that we could then sell to people. You know, I, I tell people we're Ocean Alliance, we're not Ocean Alone. You know, our goal is to work with people and collaborate. And we started by building our own drones, but we thought, you know, a lot of biologists aren't gonna be able to build our own drones. And we had all sorts of high tech ways of collecting snot and vacuum and this and that. But I thought, you know what? They're not gonna do this in Gabon, West Africa, let's say. So basically, we came down to this very fundamental issue of a drone we bought off the shelf and then we stick Petri dishes to it and fly it through an exhalation of a whale. And it really is that simple. And I'm actually very proud to tell you that last year, 32 groups around the world used our protocols with the work that they were doing. So that was, it's pretty exciting. And that's what we want. Um, as, as I think Jeff said earlier, there's no I in team, but anyway, so here's a little video of, of a snot bot with a blue whale. And um, if you don't mind, I'm actually gonna play that one again, just so we can see it. Mm -hmm. Certainly part of the challenge was actually, um, where do you put the Petri dishes? And we think that a blow is going straight up because we just look out at it, but actually the whale's moving forward and the blow is arcing back. So basically we're behind the whale and you see we just fly into the cloud. I mean, I had dishes pointing down and I had snot on the back of the dish. And I also wanted to say a key idea about SnotBot 2, and I don't mean to be rude to scientists in the white coat and the pencil protectors and whatever, but we're not always the best people at engaging kids and engaging people and, and you know, having a digestible story. And I have been criticized. People have said I'm demeaning science by calling it SnotBot, but you know what? We've had a massive outreach from kids. I mean, you can't walk away from this talk today. You will remember Snotbot, uh, you know, as you will, um, Giles's dog. But here is the, um, the, uh, the um, exhalation again, just to sort of watch this. Um, now, this is a little unfair, by the way. This is the largest animal that's ever existed on the planet with the lungs about the size of a, of a, a VW. So hardly really a difficult use case, but it, it's still good to go. And I think I have another one here. We had a 3D camera here and a 30, 360 degree camera that we put on the whale. We weren't flying another drone, but of course a giant blue whale gives you a, a, a giant result here. Sort of bingo, there you go. You've all been snotted, you know? And you can see the, 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 the snot on the dish and a lot of snot on the dish. And, you know, I'll go on an expedition and I'll tell people that I got 50 samples, but we have six dishes on each drone. So it actually could be, you know, 360 samples if you want, you know, but it, it's, it's um, you know, we like to sort of do it. So here we go, here are the dishes and we just put some tape around them and then we send them off to our different partner labs for hormone, genetics, microbiomes, ketones, um, et cetera. Now, clearly 
the most exciting thing about the drone, and there have been papers written about this, is, is, is it's a non-invasive tool. So um, there have been a number of papers published, including one by us, showing that the whales cannot hear the high-frequency propeller blades that we find so annoying. Those high-frequency sounds don't get through the water, but the low-frequency sounds like a helicopter do. And what's so exciting about, about the drones, too, is that we've got a camera that's filming everything throughout the flight. We know the height. We know the position. We know the date. We know the time. So again, we've got photogrammetry. We're doing photo ID. We've now got thermal cameras looking at scars. And I really think we're, we're, we are in a, a little bit of a sort of a drone revolution, let's say, of democratizing marine mammal science. Because even if you can't afford a boat somewhere, let's say in Timor-Leste, do you know what I mean? You can fly a drone from the shore over the channel. How many animals are you seeing? How are they engaging? I mean, I don't want to be rude here, but if you asked a team of people to design the worst way to study whales, they would probably say standing in a small boat. And that's how it's been done pretty much for the last mm -hmm. um, you know, 50 years. Mm -hmm. um, and what I like about the sanctuary and what I like about today's group is, is thinking outside the box, if you don't mind. You know, how do we solve these diverse problems? And, and, and I, I think Jeff said it, you know, can we create citizen science where they're using these tools? And, you know, I will say, you know, I could actually spend the 10 minute talk about why I, I love the sanctuary and maybe we'll do that on a different day, but I can tell you one thing that people don't think about a lot and it's sort of heartbreaking, but I'm currently permitted to sort of collect snot from, I don't know, 20 different species of cetacean, including small cetaceans. But guess what? I'm not really permitted to collect snot from a Northern right whale because it's a greatly endangered whale. Mm -hmm. So let's be clear the most non-invasive tool out there, you know, you can't use for the most endangered whale. Mm -hmm. So permitting has been a challenge and I'm not against the permit. I, I understand it. They're like, oh my God, this is a new technology. You know, we want to make damn sure, you know, you're correct before we let you with an endangered whale. But I'm really thinking that, that so I have a new idea I'm not going to discuss today, but I've spoken to National Fisheries about permitting, and in many ways they said, Ian, go and test it somewhere else. So we're probably gonna test this idea in Mexico. And then when we validated the idea, we'll bring it back to North America. Mm -hmm. And on one level, I understand it, but that's a bit sad. And wouldn't it be nice if there was somewhere within 150 miles of my base where I could go out and validate this, these non-invasive tools you know, in a controlled manner, where you know you can observe the behavior of the animal before you use the tool, use the tool, observe the animal behavior afterwards for multiple days. Because I think for some of the detagging work, they've actually shown, you know, it takes an animal's heartbeat, you know, 10, 12 hours sometimes to slow down from an event. So I'm excited by sort of the cost benefit, as we said, being able to use um, the whale sanctuary to sort of try out ideas and you know, from short-term projects, long-term projects, we, you know, we want to take these ideas into the wild, but even a snotbot program, you know, with sort of four people and a little boat, it's still expensive. It's still expensive. So if we can go to a donor, support her and validate it in the whale sanctuary and then take it out to some of these critically endangered whales, I think it's going to be a, a fantastic opportunity. And I have to put this in there because you know, I, 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 you know, I, I mean, did I invent Snotbot? No, a team invented Snotbot. But if we want to step back and just say one thing, you know, on one level, we have a drone over here on our right and all these sensors on the left, and then we stick them together and we put duct tape on them and we tell everyone we're brilliant. You know, I, I think this is moving so fast with, with new, center, new sensors, new technologies, new ideas, you know, as Jeff said, um, now I don't know, was it, was it Jeff or Giles? Maybe it was Giles, but I, I, I love the way she said something like, the right way to understand what's inside a whale is by looking at what they throw out. Giles, you're in trouble. That was Giles. I'm, I'm taking that, <laughs> I've taken that. No, anyway, um, but, but thank you for that. And I think as you, you're all aware here, 
some of the most critically endangered whales in the world are now small cetaceans. And, you know, as, as Jeff said, you know, you just don't want to be stressing these animals getting close, you know, so particularly if you want to do sort of long studies, you know, so anyway, um, I will say, I, I think Jeff Giles, just FYI, we did successfully collect um, snot from uh, an orca up in um, Alaska using one of these very small drones and Scott Baker did the analysis for us. Um, so we have validated the tools and certainly that's something we are looking at for the future. There are now smaller and smaller drones that I think we can use you know, to collect these data sets, whether they be you know, viruses and bacteria from populations of, of small animals. Anyway, I have no idea how long I've talked for. I'm sure it's too long, <laughs> but, but um, you know, really appreciate the opportunity to join all of you. And again, see the opportunities here, change our minds as to the value of healthy oceans, healthy whales, and let's just go out and create tools that will change the world. So thank you all very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you to all three of my guests. These have been incredible. Um, and I'm, I'm excited by the levels of, of synergy, right? So bringing all of these things together in the sanctuary and the wild, incredible science, exciting for our students coming in. And, you know, our last webinar was on uh, how we study communication in cetaceans uh, in the sanctuary and in the wild and how we can go back and forth between those. And so you, you're adding another layer here of assessment, study, getting to know these animals in the wild and in the sanctuary in a way that, that respects their autonomy, respects them, and adds to our ability uh, to protect them. So this is incredibly exciting. Um, what I'd love to do now is just get to a few of our questions from the audience, because we've got some really good ones. Um, and I'm going to start with, uh, there was a really good one. Can SCAT show family relations? Uh, yes, we can get uh, DNA uh, from SCAT samples, so we mm -hmm. can... Um, know who the individual was that left us the sample. And then we compare that against uh, Noah's, essentially a, a catalog, a yearbook of DNA uh, that Noah mm -hmm. is uh, fa fairly much responsible for, for uh, keeping up to date. And in that we have paternity and maternity and uh, you know family, family relations through that. So yes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What are some of the uh, situations or conditions that, uh, uh, is there anything off limits in terms of what we could assess or diagnose uh, with any of these methods, either poop, snot, or blow? Um, are we at the point now where we can detect any kind of pathogen, any kind of uh, genetic uh, issue? What are the current uh, limitations that we are trying to overcome? Well, uh, I, I'd like to ask that. Ian a, a quick question. Um, uh, I just was having a conversation with some uh, collaborators, the folks that are going to be analyzing our scout samples going forward at the uh, San Diego Wildlife Alliance. Um, and, and one of them was asking about prolactin and whether or not, uh, actually he was asking Sam if prolactin, which is related to, uh, it's a hormone uh, that related to all kinds of things, but pregnancy and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And evidently you cannot get prolactin from feces, but you can maybe from blow. And I think that's really interesting. So I guess my comment would be, if you can't get it from one, you can get it from the other. And that's why working collaboratively with other researchers is so important and being able to share samples because your lab might not be able to do something, but somebody else's lab can. Exactly. And the only comment being that I've done a bit of work in, in, in environmental toxicology, alas, we don't think we'll have the capacity to collect persistent organic pollutants from whale exhalation. 
Um, we're hoping that we can do medals. So we have taken some blows and we've sent them in um, to look to see if there would be any metals because that being something silly, you're not you're unlikely to find metals floating in the water, you know. So, so we're so we're looking at that. But um, to Giles's point, yeah, it's it's all about um, collaboration. And, and yeah, well, actually, Giles, you and I can we'll email after the event. Okay. Great, thank you. Does the does the SCAC question, and I guess any of these, and I think I know the answer to this. Does this apply across any? cetacean species, the use of these kinds of uh, techniques? So if I am understanding the, the question, uh, can you, for example, in our case, can you use dogs to, to, to sniff out any kind of cetacean fecal samples? Um, and I would say uh, theoretically, yes. However, uh, practically, in a practical sense, no. Um, it depends on a lot of different things like the tide currents, mm -hmm. um, how much chalk you have on the water, yeah. um, how fast the animal travels. So like a harbor porpoise or even worse, a doll's porpoise, it's going to poop and be gone before you, you know, even really know where the animal was. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. in some cases, the, the fecal samples are so watery and diffuse, they just dissipate into the water very, very quickly. And so in a, uh, an ideal uh, candidate would be any species that eat fatty rich diet um, or a lot of it, like a, a humpback whale poop that is uh, com uh, comes from a, a krill meal. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that's a very, very um, oily sample you're going to get and it's going to stick together for a long time. A very well-fed fish eating killer whale the samples I showed some, they're like pancake batter, you know, spread across the surface of the water. Those can stay together for a very long time. And then lastly, an example would be a mammal eating killer whale feces, depending on what the meal is, we're still trying to get our brains around why on earth those guys, they poop so cryptically, it's very frustrating. Our colleague Brad Hansen says, it takes him about 60 hours to find one scat sample. We were six, we were successful finding two this year. Interestingly, one of them uh, was with the aid of a, of a drone. Mm -hmm. um, and our, our colleagues at the Center for Well Research, Michael Weiss was on board with us flying his drone. So we love that too, being able to combine platforms and keep a bo one boat off the water as much as possible. Um, and so uh, the, I think that, um, the one, the other one that Eva found, actually, she did find a, a, a scat sample from a, a mammal eating killer whale, and it was about 90% fur. Uh, we think fur from seal because it was very, mm -hmm. very short, short fur, whereas a scat sample from a, a transient that I had collected, been on board when Brad collected, collected one back in 2010, that one was also 90% or more fur, uh, about this big, the size of a... Um, of a kind of a owl pellet. And that one was really coarse red, uh, clearly stellar sea lion. So when they have had a meal that is, uh, that is from an animal that has fur, I think we have a better opportunity or, or chance of collect because that hair is gonna help the scat sample float versus mm -hmm. something that is almost entirely probably a, a, a heavier, like, uh, like a blood meal, we would call it in terrestrial terms, uh, something that is uh, more dense, uh, has the capacity to, to sink. So uh, a muscle meal, or um, we're not even, yeah, so uh, I hope that was long winded, but no, not all scat is, is equal. <laughs> not all scat is, is equal. To, uh, I'm taking to all of these, I'm taking all of John's lines, it's going to be. Um, BBC I know Blue Planet, Ian Kerr <laughs> says, not all scat is equal. Not all poop is equal. Um, maybe just to round out our conversation, I'm going to ask you guys to do some blue sky stuff. And just if you had your brothers, what's the next thing that you want to see in this area in terms of what we need to know about whales that will actually help us move forward with protecting them, keeping them healthy in whatever scenario. Hmm. 
Well, how about I start with, with something different? Okay. Um, I'm going to do a, a political answer, but I think the problem we have nowadays is um, people are sort of very worn down by the save the whale sort of idea, icon, whatever expression. And, um, you know, if you notice actually at the beginning of my talk, I didn't actually say it, but there were two words and it just said, why whales? And I just think it, it's, it's very tragic that people don't understand, you know, how food, well, I don't remember, again, I, how important whales are. And in actual fact, even like as nitrogen pumps, I'm here in Gloucester, Massachusetts, and I really believe one of the reasons sort of cod stocks were down was because they killed hundreds of thousands of whales who were defecating and, and fertilizing the phytoplankton that was feeding and so on and so on. And, and um, you know, these animals, you know, play an important role in, in the balancing of, of, you know, this blue planet's ecosystem. So that's not really your question. So I'll pass it on to Jeff and Giles. They can do the difficult answers. But at my end, it, it's whales are just more than charismatic megafauna. How's that? Mm -hmm. How can we get mm -hmm. that message out there, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you, Ian. Jeff? Yeah, you know, for me, you know, it's, it's uh, these animals are incredible animals, but we've been doing a disservice to them because we haven't been able to, to study them as effectively as, as the terrestrial animals. And it's just because of the habitat they live in. But we're at a time right now where, where the innovation and, and technology is, has, is at a point where we can start studying these guys a lot more effectively. And, and Ian's work is incredible and Giles too. And merging those two together, you know, so that we can see mm -hmm. what the animal decades. And, and so you can get out there for those, those species that are, that are not as easily studied. You know, so you can get those samples that are so precious. And, and like we've all said, you know, it, it is very costly to be doing research out there. It is, you know, and, and there's limited dollars and those dollars are, are shrinking every year. So we rely on, on uh, angel donors and people that have a lot of money to, to support some of these projects. And, mm -hmm. But that's not the way we should be doing this. We should be, this should be government supported. And it's not, it's not, not very little of it is anymore. Mm -hmm. And, and we need to focus more on it because it's our oceans that are, that are keeping us alive. And, and we need to start taking better care of them. I often say it's kind of like, you know, clear cutting, you know, we, we in the Northwest where I come from back in the seventies, it was very obvious, obvious what was happening with the clear cutting, but you don't see what's going on underwater and whales are the indicators of what's happening underwater. And, and so outside out of mind, and I'm afraid that we've, we've kind of lost sight a little bit and, and we need to refocus on trying to learn more about these animals and get baseline information on little known species. And there's, and, and most of those, most of the cetaceans fall in that category now. Yeah. And I would add, that's excellent. And I would add learning about these animals in their natural habitat, um, where they are actually doing what they want to do instead of what they're made to do. So that's, that's, a, that's a real authentic education. Giles? Um, I, uh, my philosophy about it is, and what I try and teach my students, whenever I have an opportunity to talk about it, is um, really trying to um, teach and, and embody the concepts of conservation biology, the basic tenets of conservation biology. And one of them that has always uh, really resonated with me is to recognize that species have intrinsic value separate from what humans can gather or gain from, from the exploitation of that species. Mm -hmm. And uh, to, it, when we think about it in those terms that um, species co-evolved with each other throughout the millennia, long before humans had, a, had the capacity to Im impact it in a negative way in the way that we have in a very short amount of time, in a blink of an eye, really, we have changed the ability of animals and, their, and the ecosystems that they rely on their ability to, to, to be healthy and, and in a depleted population to recover. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that's kind of my goal is to um, help people understand that, that we're just a part of the ecosystem. We're not at the top of a, of a pyramid. Um, and that just as, as we have uh, an intrinsic value to live and hopefully thrive, um, so do other species. And the more we can recognize that, that we're, that we're in this together, 
um, the, the better all of us are going to be. Well, this is, this, yeah, here, here. I mean, to all three of what you guys have said, and, you know, I'm, I'm so thrilled and looking forward to all of you being up in Port Hilford and us really getting down to talking about what some of the stuff, the great stuff we can do. And, and just to say that what to me this represents all of this technology, all of this work you're doing uh, in combination with the sanctuary model means that we can now learn about these animals in a much more natural captive situation and then take that information and put it back out in the conservation. We don't have to keep them in tanks. We don't have to confine them in barren environments in order to collect data that can then be used to help them in the wild. Once, once sanctuaries come online, that's not gonna be necessary anymore. And you are the leaders of, of that of that technology, that methodology. And I would say that that philosophy that no whale or dolphin should have to give up their life so that we can learn about them and help their counterparts in the wild. And, and I thank you for that very, very much. Um, well, I wanna thank everyone who has uh, joined us. There are many, many questions. Um, I'd love to see another webinar like this with you folks where maybe we talk about some of the things that we can interest young students in, in terms of the work that you're all doing. And um, thank you for, for your incredible work, all of you for joining. Um, and uh, thank you everyone who's, who's attended and everyone be well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Stay safe.